Thank you. All right, well, good evening, gentlemen. Um, we are continuing our study in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, and tonight we're going to cover uh, verses 10 through 16. But as Craig usually does, we'll do a little bit of backdrop and make sure we remember where we've come from. So who wrote 1 Corinthians? Paul. He did. And um, how much do we know about what Corinth was actually like. Um, you guys remember from the discussion what, what some of the issues were that they were dealing with? Sin City. Sin City. It was actually one of the most important cities in Greece at that time. And um, they were very worldly. It was a huge center of commerce. And uh, they were definitely mired in kind of what seems like our country has become mired in today. Materialism, pursuit of wealth, um, immorality, and in particular, sexual immorality. It seems like that was a huge issue for them um, that they were dealing with. And, um, and so Paul, anybody remember about when Paul went to uh, Corinth on his second missionary visit from our study in Acts? Remember when that was? Around, around AD 51. Um, and he spent about a year and a half on that first uh, visit as he was establishing that church. And uh, if you remember, he met Aquila and Priscilla there. Um, they were tent makers, and um, they uh, helped him establish the church there. He also had Apollos there. And uh, as we remember from a few weeks ago, we were talking about how the divisions had come, and people were following Apollos and other leaders. Um, so, um, so this letter was written um, because he had heard of issues that were arising in the church in Corinth, um, he had heard that from a couple of sources. He had actually had some letters that were sent to him, but he also had a couple of emissaries that had came to Ephesus where he was and let him know that, hey, there's some real issues in the church in Corinth and uh, that need to be addressed. And, and we know from reading 1 Corinthians that it sounds like there was a letter that he had written earlier to them that was misinterpreted and misunderstood. So in some of the cases in this letter, he's actually writing back to them to clarify certain things that, uh, that were, were misunderstood. And so this letter was written in somewhere between <coughs> AD 54 and 55, so it's probably three or four years after the church was established, probably two plus years after he had left. Um, and so um, in, previously in 1 Corinthians, we, we were, we, uh, he was addressing a couple of key issues, if you remember. He was talking about wisdom and that's only found in the Word of God, not in, in man. Um, he talked about the divisions in the church and kind of they were following different leaders and there were sex, sex kind of following their own, their own teachings. Uh, he talked about settling disputes within the church and not you know, bringing in outside people to settle disputes. Um, he talked about sexual immorality a lot and about how to deal with that in the church. Uh, and then the last time we uh, met, uh, he talked about kind of principles for marriage. So tonight we get the, uh, the uh, opportunity to talk about his teacher in coming divorce. And that's really what this next section in 1 Corinthians is, is kind of talking about. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 16, and then we'll kind of dive in. Okay, uh, to the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Father, thank you for your word. Uh, may the things that we discussed tonight from you, and uh, Lord, we just ask that you'd open our eyes and ears as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so let's, uh, let's dive in right here in verse 10. 
So uh, it, it's interesting. He says here, it's not I, but the Lord, um, kind of right up front as he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, how a husband and wife should not separate from each other. So I thought it would be worthwhile to look at what Jesus said in different aspects of his teaching about the topic of divorce. And, and we can go there and see his words, Jesus's words, in addition to what Paul had to say here. Um, so why don't we do that? Can someone look up Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 2 through 12? Uh, maybe, um, Greg, could you do that? And then, Sky, would you look up Matthew chapter 5, um, verse 32? And Sam, if you wouldn't mind doing Matthew 19, 8 and 9. And we'll kind of read through those and kind of listen to what Jesus had to say. Mark. Mark chapter 10, 2 through 12. Oh, sorry. You've got Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 32. And I'm 19, 8 and 9, right? 19, 8 and 9. Yeah. So why don't we start, uh, Greg, with yours. And the Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, he asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of your heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother, I'm sorry, leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the shoe two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, not let man separate. And in the house of the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Okay, so you know, basically Jesus is pretty straightforward. Kind of parroting right back what, uh, what John had to say in, in, um, uh, in uh, his note. Um, Sky, how about Matthew 5.32? I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, is um, teaching on divorce. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, um, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that it, that is divorced cometh adultery. Okay, so basically it's saying the same thing. And Sam, how about Matthew 19, 8 and 9? He said to them, Because of your hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. All right, and then I'll do Luke um, 16, verse 18. Um, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Um, so let's go, kind of go back and look at that verse 10 and 11 in, in 1 Corinthians. So it, it, reminding you what it said, it says, To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and should not divorce, and the husband should not divorce his wife. So if you go through kind of each of these verses, it's pretty clear um, marriage was created by God. Um, it was created as a gift to man, um, and it was a command for life. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a casual commitment. It was a, a permanent commitment, and marriage is a divine institution. It wasn't something that was created lightly, you know, like other things that might um, might be undone. This was a, a lifetime thing. Um, and so basically what, what um, Paul is saying here is that those who are married you know, shouldn't really be thinking about separation, that reconciliation should always be the goal. Um, but he did give one reason why divorce would be acceptable. What was that reason? Adultery. Adultery, yep. Or abandonment with one leaves. So Actually, it's really just adultery is really the only, you know, the only kind of caveat that is given there. But it doesn't require that. Um, you know, it, it certainly is possible. But I think even, you know, in, in, if you look at the way this is kind of laid out, it says that's certainly a possibility. But it's not, 
not necessarily even what God wants, even in that situation, it certainly is, a, is an alternative. But I think um, um, it's not required. So if someone does commit adultery, divorce is not required. God would still hope for reconciliation between the two, um, but he does permit it in, in that particular case. Any other thoughts on, on the conditions under which divorce is okay? Scott? Not necessarily on that, but I just the, the, the passage that I read, I noticed in it where it said anyone who marries one who was divorced commits adultery too. That's right. That's interesting. I, I just didn't in say the world where you know, it's you know, what you marry is impossible. <laughs> well, it's certainly not easy. <laughs> it's impossible. I, I can never see eye to eye of God with that one. I think the other exception is if um, the other spouse is not a believer because Paul says the first way he says you know this is um, I give this charge not I but the Lord in verse 12 he says to the rest they say I not the Lord so he's saying this is my two cents not necessarily the word of God uh, that if a brother takes his wife and a believer she consents to live with him he should not divorce her but he doesn't say that God commanded that so I think that might be an exception. To the so I'll, we'll, we'll get to there in, in a minute because I think that's an area we definitely want to kind of explore a little bit. Um, but, but you guys both made some comments that I think, you know, is worth expanding on, which, which you said is that if you are, if you marry a divorced woman, then you're, you know, basically she's committing adultery and you're committing adultery with her. Yes. Yeah. Point, you point the finger at, the, at me, even though like maybe I was unmarried married this woman, she's been divorced before, I'm committing adultery because really she should be with the guy that she was. Right. Absolutely. So it's just an interesting and it sounds like it sounds like to me they're saying like if if one party leaves though, you know what I mean, it's not on you. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it says in that case, I mean, what are you gonna do? <laughs> like, I mean, well, you know, the, the I guess the challenge well. is it's really only the physical act of adultery that actually Freeze the we'll call it the uh, the innocent party uh, in that situation. It's not if the person you know disappears or walks away or whatever, they're still married to that person. It's really the physical act of adultery that actually frees the innocent spouse. At least that's my my best interpretation of what God says here, and that if that happens, then the innocent spouse is basically freed of the marriage covenant and then could remarry. But if someone just disappears, walks away, I mean, the only other the only other physical act that occur that can occur is death, right? So it's adultery or death. But to address your point, Brooke, I, I, for those of you guys that are married, I, I don't know. I think God uses our spouse to refine us because um, I don't know. I you know, being alone is a whole lot easier than having to live with somebody else and care for them and love for them, love them and put them first. That's really hard work. I don't know about you guys, but it certainly has tested my faith and you know um, made me a better man for being you know for for being in a relationship. And what what do you guys think? It shows you where you need to work on your job. <laughs> yes, it does. It sure does. Plenty of opportunity to practice your humility and thinking about others because it's pretty much a prerequisite. If you're going to get married, you got it's because you're kind of becoming one anyway. You know, you, you got to really think about them before you. In so many cases, it's tough for me. You know, it's being divorced and remarried myself. You know, and I, it draws up many questions in my head. You know, of course, selfishly thinking about my own circumstances, like, you know, you, you, you delve into if, if, a, if someone looks at another woman and, and fantasizes about another woman or another man, and they've con committed adultery in their own mind, they've already, they are just the same as committing adultery. And, you know, I felt like my ex committed adultery on me, but I never did prove it, I got in a fight with the dude, you know what I mean, and, and not like I wasn't there, you know what I mean, I didn't really see it, I don't have proof or anything like that, and that's how divorce came about for me the next day. Now, that being said, at the time, 
I would say I was a non-believer. I believed in God, but I didn't attend church. You know, we, we had gone to church a few times, you know what I mean? I don't know what her beliefs were because we weren't, you know, we were doing drugs and drinking and, you know, partying together and then going to church every now and then when we were sober. <laughs> well, that that's kind of the beauty of Christ, what Christ did for us because at the moment that we turned our life over to him and, you know, God opened our eyes to the truth, everything in our past has been forgiven. It doesn't matter whatever it was. It's, it's a sin. Regardless. regardless, you know, Christ died for that and, and you know, the blood of Calvary just kind of washes over all of that for us, which, um, which is a beautiful thing. As well as repentance, right? You know that you sin and you, know, you, you realize, well, looks like I committed sin here, you know, and you repent again for what you did. And... Well, you that's said... where, yeah, where does it put you? <laughs> I mean, here's a good question. You've already messed it up. It's like, well, you said where does that, that leave you? you? So, you believe in so God. say more. But you hadn't well, been converted I mean, at that point. No, so, you know, believe. the demons believe in God. That doesn't sure. mean you're converted. So, right. I take that you weren't converted at that point. You haven't, you didn't repent. So, technically, you're wrong. I mean, you may have said you believed in God, but you're really not considered a believer at that point until you repent and, 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 and convert. So, yeah, well said. Um, another weird question. How come most of the prophets in the Bible were never married? Well, you know, it's interesting because there, there are points, even in this letter, that talks about, um, you know, that the hope would be that you would not be married, that you would be better to, uh, able to devote yourself to serving God fully. Without, fully without having another person in your life that you needed to take care of as well. And That's few, kind of where I'm at. And a few weeks ago, um, we talked about, I think there was a, a passage we went through where we were talking about um, that you know, don't let your sexual desires overwhelm you, that God, you know, created the institution of marriage and that that's the only way in which our sexual desires can be fulfilled, but that he did say that if you're not um, compelled to do that, that he would rather see you devoted to prayer and to serving the Lord and not being married. And that, that's, uh, so I think that, that's, that's kind of where I would go when I, sure. when I'm at. I think every man is called differently, it um, is, yeah. you know, and so certainly Paul said in, in his case, Paul never got married. He, he was devoted to, to Christ and teaching and discipling, and, and he never got married. That's cool that you say that. That's, I just wanted to hear you say that because that's the way I feel. Yeah, well, God's Word says it, so I think we're safe in assuming that that, that was God's intent. I think marriage, the one thing that comes to my mind is pride. That was like, you know, you may think you're humble, but boy, you get in a relationship like that where it's 24 7 and there's no way out. Like, <laughs> I just I mean, feel that it's a have privilege to, to be a servant and get beaten down all the time. It's a privilege, it's an honor. Well, getting married is no small commitment. No, I mean, we think I'm, about it as a lifetime commitment, there's no way out. Yeah. And you basically commit to that person that you're going to put them in front of yourself all the time. And that is that is tough assignment. And we can't do it without God's help. I can't do it without God's help. No. Okay, well, let's move on. Any, any other thoughts there? Or do you want to move on to 12 and verse 12 and 13? Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> 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 let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty tough subject there, guys. <laughs> yep, got it. <laughs> was that cricket? <laughs> these are tough. These are, yeah, I said, I said to Craig, thanks, Craig. You're giving me one yeah, of the thanks, toughest, yeah, toughest the assignments. He'd <laughs> uh, rather be coaching volleyball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, let me read verse 12 and 13 again. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So you basically, Jesus didn't really talk about this. You know, if there were other verses in the Bible, I'd point you right to him and say, okay, well, you know, here's, here's where Jesus talked about this. And, and he didn't. But obviously this was an issue in the church at Corinth, and that's why Paul felt like he had to address it. 
And so I think that's why he said, I, not the Lord. There were no other points in you know, Jesus' specific recorded teachings that he could point to and say, this is what he said. Was there other accounts where it was more, was it worded more like uh, being like equally yoked? Or so was it like there, there is, and there is, um, um, I, maybe not well, specifically about. Second Corinthians 6 um, says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness. But that suggests that Any kind of you're all that one of one of the two are already believers, right? So this would be a statement to a believer saying, don't marry an unbeliever. But I think what probably happened in Corinth and what one of them was converted and the other one wasn't. So now you have a situation where you have a believer and an unbeliever in, in a marriage together. And so that's, I think, the specific situation that he's trying to address is, well, what do you do now? And I think it happened a lot there because there were lots of conversions going on all the time, but it still happens today. I mean, there's still situations where you could have two, um, two unbelievers. One of them becomes a believer. Now you have the situation where you're unequally, unequally yoked, and that's what he's trying to address. Well, I thought it was interesting how it says because one is saved, the other one considered holy like what does that yeah, exactly yeah. mean like so it sure sounds like you kind of get credit <laughs> well you're, it, you're one yeah you're one well it, it, it he's not saying that 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 person because is saved because the other spouse is a believer that's not what it's saying it's actually saying that that the marriage is sanctified because Set there's apart. yeah because there's a believer in the mix and the family is sanctified because of the believer in the mix and the children are sanctified because right. of the believer in the mix. He's not saying that the unbelieving spouse is saved by the belief of the other spouse. So holy means set apart? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the so definition would be important there, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So <laughs> it I, does sound like holy, you think, it just sounds like. But if you go on even further in this, uh, you know, it talks about, um, so we just talked about verse 14. In verse 15, it says, um, or 16, it talks about, for how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So basically in this, you know, marriage of a believer and an unbeliever, it's basic, he's basically saying, look, stay in the marriage because your testimony to the unbelieving spouse could be the reason that that person actually, you know, hears the word of God and God opens their eyes and they become a Christian. So what he's basically saying is that the principles for this unbeliever believer marriage are no different than the than the principles for a two believer marriage that you know um there's no divorce well, it's kind of like the same principle of like saying well now i'm a believer i'm i'm not going to come out in the public it's kind of like the same kind of principle i'm better than him i don't, I don't want to be seen with him yeah i think he's saying that you know there's that you being in in the marriage brings you know, God's blessing into the marriage because yeah. you're the believer and to your family and to your children. And you have a, an opportunity to share, you know, the gospel, share uh, faith in Jesus with the unbelieving spouse. And it could be through that mechanism that they come into a saving faith. Right. It sure does sound like there's, because it says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In yes. such cases, okay. the brother or sister is not enslaved. Yes. So, so that so, sounds like another way of that's it's, you're free if that. But it's only if it's it's not saying that the believing partner can separate. What it's saying is if the unbelieving partner says, "I can't deal with this, I yeah. want a divorce." Basically, it's saying, "Okay, let that person go." It's not adultery if you remarry after that. That's right. That's right. Because so being a believer, you could go remarry now and not feel like you sinned. <coughs> yes. Once the unbeliever separates and causes that divorce to happen, then the then the the innocent believing partner is freed from the marriage covenant. But only God knows if they're a true believer. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> You're making it tough for me, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Kind of. and, and, I, and I look at it as, and, you know, I could be wrong too. Whenever it says like. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. To sanctify means like learning, right? Isn't that like, sanctification is 
the process of learning about the gospel of the no, sure. In, in, in another word, to be influenced, um, yeah. and the fact that that marriage is holy because of the believing spouse, right. that the union of the two people is uh, is holy. Basically, um, clarifying not to keep you from marrying someone just because they're a non-believer. Like it's okay to marry an unbeliever because that unbeliever could. Is gonna be, is gonna well, it's actually not. Idea. It's actually not saying that because if you look at, uh, let's go and look at Second Corinthians six. Um, so this is a statement that is to a, to believers. So if you're already a believer, th this is a statement to believers. So do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? So what that's saying is, if you are a believer. Do not marry an unbeliever. This is really marry, This is really addressing a situation where you have two people who are married. One of them becomes a believer after the marriage has actually happened, and now you have the situation of a believer and a non-believer in a marriage. But it isn't saying that it's okay to marry an unbeliever, the a believer marrying an unbeliever. Because it, here it says it's not okay to marry an unbeliever. Right. That's not okay. It, what the other? What it's really talking about? in that other verse is if you are in a marriage yeah, and you're not believers and one of you become a believer subsequent to being married what do you do about that mm -hmm. and you can see that happening in Corinth where you know there's a preaching of the gospel there's a lots of people coming into saving faith of Christ and you could easily see a situation where one person becomes a Christian the other one's not and it's really addressing well what do you do and so what Paul's saying is in that situation the believing spouse should stay committed to the unbelieving spouse. But if the unbelieving spouse chooses to leave and divorce the believing spouse, then let them go. It's basically isn't that, isn't that the same principle as the, as the church thing, that people in the church, we're supposed to hold them to what it is. And people outside of the church, we, we just look at them and do what they do because we have yeah, no, no control of them. Yeah, no, it's a good parallel. You know, that's yeah. what's it's jumping at me, that's a similar... Um... Yep, for sure. But it also is, it, 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 you know, the, 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 the marriage is for, for, for forever, you know, it's, uh, it, it's till you, you swear on a cult on it, until you die, basically, and so it's kind of interesting that there's even a, a way to divorce you know, well, I think it speaks to just how abhorrent sexual immorality is to God. And right, that, can, that you can, I mean, yeah. if you see, you know, how God reacted to things that were sexually immoral, he, you know, his sure. wrath on that, you know, really seems severe compared to other things that, you know, so people have, so. exactly. And so you can see him saying here, basically, God is such a terrible violation of the marriage covenant that, that he's allowing divorce to occur in that situation. Um, yeah, even every time it's talked about in the Bible, it always seems to have special emphasis. Like even symmetry, like in Revelation, it's talking about going through some of that stuff like the whore. You know what I mean? Like it, it always seems like it's set apart from everything else. It seems really worse, you know. Well, you know, when he talks about it being um, he kind of... Um, comparable to Christ's relationship with the church. I mean, that, I can't even fathom what the Christ's relationship with the church is, why, is, you know, is, is really all about. And you think about him using that analogy when he talks about the union of a husband and a wife. And so that's telling you that it is way beyond what we can understand mm -hmm. it to be. Um, and, and certainly he, you know, he's held it in high esteem. And um, and I think that's why, even in all of these situations, basically it's saying no divorce, no divorce, no divorce. Marriage is for life, and there are only really two scenarios where it's okay, where someone commits adultery or an unbelieving spouse decides to leave. Those are the two, or death. Those are the, you know, the three, the three situations. Trevor comes first. <laughs> 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 I, I, I just I still think it's in, impossible. That's why married people always die happy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Don't you have to like people too, though, before you marry them? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's to me what I you know, to, to me and to my mind. <laughs> yeah, so when thinking about raising my kids and when thinking about you know really wanting for my daughters, I got three daughters, you know, for for the gospel to catch on to them, you know, for them to grasp onto the gospel before they come of age because the, it's just not the way of the world, you know what I mean? The way of the world is, you know, you know, test drive it before you buy it, you know what I mean? Like, it's just how it is. Yeah, bad. That's a very tough thing to think about. And my son, you know what I mean? All of them. And, you know, it's, even it's a worse pretty for big sin you're going to you're gonna commit here if you, you know, go out and, and become sexually active. Yeah, I think hard. it's it's really hard yeah. today because, it, you know, not that it hasn't always been hard, but all the messages of our society, everything from what you see on TV to what, you know, what happens, you know, in the movies to what you hear in music, I mean, any of yeah, that no is all bombarding. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that the enemy <coughs> is using that, right? Because we know how powerful that is, and, and the enemy is using that to attack us, yeah. um, for sure. There's no question in my mind that he's using it to attack us. A big reason why it's emphasized so much in here is because he knows. And I feel like it's a big reason why young people turn away from God too, because it's like it almost becomes like yeah. a choice. Am I going to be? Uh, am I not going to have sex till I get married? You know, I mean, it's like all or nothing. I feel like right. sometimes with, with young people, that's kind of they think. Well, I can't, I can't be, you know, a believer and and choose God, so to speak. I guess and have sex. You know what I mean? So it's like I, I'm, I'm not going to go that route. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I think that really no, is kind of, I want to go do what I want to do, you know, and I can't do both, so. We, we all kind of do, though. We all yeah. kind of want to do what we want to do. We don't want to be subservient right. to anyone else. We want to do it. That's our nature. That's the simple nature of man, mm -hmm. and that's I'm a classic example of, of that. Me too. You know, it's, yeah. you know, the Holy Spirit's the only thing that can change a man. You're right. It well, is the only thing that can change. I'm with Sky too, though. Like I want my son to get it right the first time. You know, I don't want him to have to come back and go, oh, yeah. you know, what was I think? I'm stupid, like I, I did. You know what I mean? Like, we, <laughs> I don't want to have to learn the hard way. I don't want him to have to learn the hard way. Yeah. That's yeah. the only way I ever learned yeah. anything well, anyways. Was That's my like the hard way. Yeah. My grandchildren won't do what I do. Consequences yeah. suck. The thing to yeah. <coughs> keep in mind, and um, I'm not sure I did the best job in, the, in this either, is that. Think about how much time your kids spend outside of your influence mm -hmm. and how much of the time they spend inside your influence. And then when they're in your influence, how much time are you spending them, giving them <coughs> the things that they need, yeah. you know, to, to really... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the, and the other thing is, I mean, yes, that, like, we have the whole world against us, you know what I mean? Really, when you're raising a kid, it's, it's a world, you against the world. Literally. Yeah. And literally, yeah, it's, it's all right there in their face. It's exactly what, me, you know... I grew up the wrong way, you know what I mean? I never had anybody teaching me the gospel, um, and I know how I turned out, but yet I still, you know, I still manage to find myself in, in, in the gospel, you know. God changed my life. Jesus, you know, entered me. So it, I got to just remind myself that, that um, you know, I got to do the best I could possibly do to educate them for the time that I'm going to and and I feel like you know if that if that if I plant if I plant if the roots are dug in there, then you know if they go the wrong way, they can all you know they're still just, it's not like they're just gonna burn in hell because of their mistakes. Well, the seeds have all been planted, yeah, right? Exactly. You've had the chance to plant the word of God in their heart. So it's my job to, to create good ground for the seed. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not your responsibility to lead them to Christ, only the Holy Spirit can do that, and, and that's right. ultimately God's decision. So you right. can do he does the best job God. ever as a parent, and as difficult as it is to swallow, and, you know, that child, and you see it a lot in Christianity, where they grow up in the perfect, we'll call it the perfect Christian home, sure. and then, you know, the Still, you know, kids go, you know, become teenagers and whatnot, and then they rebel, and, and Hopefully they eventually come back, but um, sometimes they don't. Yeah, if you look at any of the recent study data on that, it, it's terrible. I mean, really? it, it, the number of kids that grew up in Christian homes that actually depart from the faith and they never come back. Never come back. And wow. you know, part of it, it, you know, I think that as as Christian parents, we also need to keep in mind that 
we can't ignore the other messages that they're going to be given. We have to talk about them too. Right. So an example would be like creation versus evolution. If you fill your kid full of everything there is to know about creation and they don't know anything about evolution and they, they learn all about evolution, you know, in a secular school, they're going to think, you, know, you, you never, yeah, yeah, you didn't yeah. tell them, the, yeah. but if you spend time making sure they know what they're going to face, what pe they're going to be told, and why you believe what you believe, not just to believe it, but why you believe what you believe, I think that gives them a better foundation to, to deal with what they're, what's going to happen to them when they, you know, when they inevitably get influenced by the world. That's my whole game plan. I'm telling you, it's under six. And that's, Apologetics of it all. I don't ever teach them anything about God without giving them the other side of it. Like, that's the whole, mm -hmm. I just had a conversation with him the other day. I'm make sure he knows that, listen, most people don't believe what I'm telling you here, buddy. You know what I mean? And you, there's going to be day, you, there's, gonna, there's days coming where you're going to have to decide where you stand on this. You know what I mean? Because there's going to be people that say they're going to think you're stupid and if that's not true, they're going to say you're wrong. And, you know, I'm telling you that Daddy fully believes that every word in here is true, mm -hmm. and there's good reason to believe that. And you know that the dinosaur thing was big with him. And that's kind of where it started. And he's watching these things, and he's learning a lot about dinosaurs, and it's all good and everything. And then he's like, "In six billion years," and I'm like, "That's not true." <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I'll be like writing or drawing or something, and something else will pop. I'm like, "That's not true." <laughs> we just keep going, but <laughs> like. You can say and do whatever you want, but we're all predestined. You can't shelter them from the reality of what's coming, and that's exactly, I agree 100%, because I didn't have that. You know, you get taught all this good stuff, and you get thrown in the world, and you're like, everybody's not nice. It's like, no, dude, it's cutthroat, ruthless people are mean. I tell them, like, you know, there's not everybody's good. You know what I mean? There's mean people out there that hurt, hurt kids and hurt women and, and do really bad things. You know, I'm not going into detail at six, but... Don't trust anybody. Well, no, but you need to, you know, re, real being realistic because it's so bad nowadays that I don't think you can wait. You can't wait till 12. I mean, there's kids that no. are getting pregnant at 12. Like, that's not the time yeah. to start having yeah. conversations. It's like 7, 8, 9. That's what you better be talking to them about it because somebody is. That's been happening. People are talking to them, especially unbeliever families. You know, they have six, seven year old kids that know everything about everything because yeah. mm -hmm. they don't care. They watch. They got social Four media words, in their palm of you know? their hand where they can watch anything or see anything they want. Is it relates back to you know, this whole Sorry. sexual purity thing, which is kind of really where this whole conversation started, is that we need to help our children understand what God's design for this was. Because, you know, uh, I've heard horror stories of people that have gotten married after they've, you know, slept around a whole bunch, and their marriage is not much of anything um, because they basically... It's nothing special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's funny you said that. I've known couples that have been together for seven years. They got married and are divorced in one year. That's pretty wild that you said that. Well, a divorce it happens all the time. Um, but that's kind of weird, though. I mean, you've been together for seven years, you get married, and then a year later you get divorced. And you, well, it goes, yeah. it goes back to, well, what is the motivation for getting married? More often yeah. than not, it's a selfish motivation. It's yeah. not a motivation of giving. And if you go into that kind of relationship thinking that it's all about you and all about what you're going to get out of it, mm -hmm. you're going to get disillusioned <laughs> really fast. <laughs> get disillusioned really yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's not that there aren't huge blessings that come. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, I would not trade my marriage for anything. I mean, it is a huge blessing in my life. Um, but... It, 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 I haven't, it hasn't been by me trying to take things. It's been by me giving things and then God blessing that. Um, so. It makes me think about like the, the unbelieving couple getting married. You know, like. Yeah, that's kind of. They're making it legal. Like that's basically the only thing. They don't believe doing. in God. Yeah, they're just they're, they're, they're atheists. Like, well, they're... I own this one and she owns me. And that's, you know, so legally we're married. You know, that's basically all you're doing. Well, yeah, but a lot yeah. of people do it. It's tax purposes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like yeah, paperwork for, stuff. Business reasons. I just, I think about, like, my mate, my first mate, went proposed to his wife over the Grand Canyon, big grand thing, you know, it was love and all this, and they're doing it for love and all. But really, marriage came from the, the Bible, came from the gospel, you know what I mean? It came. As, God created yeah, it. And you actually say things, you know. 
to God. Basically, you're taking an oath to God, but they don't, they're non believers. You know Look I mean? how many people yeah. celebrate Christmas. Well, what about it's well, like the dumbest right? thing ever? Yeah. Like, yeah. What is Christmas? Like, what, what about same sex marriages, marriages or adopting children? That's what, that's what most people think it is. You know, it's a day off. Yeah. all of that is we against what God has that's, that's right is there. set out. That's got to mm -hmm. be really, really it, a spit in God's it's, face. It's a really tough issue in today's society because. But, that, uh, but it's happening. Yeah. Sure. Who's talking about same sex marriages? Yeah, or adopting oh. children. Right. But, yeah, that, but if you think like, about it, you know, changing the structure of marriage and like, that's easy compared to now you got people saying, I'm not a boy. Like, yeah. but yeah, yeah. physically you're a boy. <laughs> like, changing, changing I mean, gender. You're, like, we're so far past even, you and know, their, their misconception of marriage too, like, that it's same, like, it's, it's moved on to something like so crazy you can't even wrap your mind around it. Like, I, so the schools like put you have the blinders on, you know. It's scary. You have to choose your gender before scary. the next semester in some California schools. They give you the option to choose your gender for the next semester. But you can choose the well, I took my dad to the, the doctor. Oh, was, that was one of the things on the questionnaire. You know, I mean, I don't know what that was. Well, I can't remember how it was worded, right? Trans. It yeah. basically said, I, maybe it was like, were you born a man? or so, I don't know. It was some weird, I don't remember how it was worded, but it was a question oh, on there. Like, they ask you if you're a transgender or something? something. I was mm. just like, wow. <laughs> well, I had to ask the lady. It was weird. It, it was, the way it was worded was kind of weird. But I was like, I'm confused. She was like, yeah, that's that probably doesn't apply to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think we just have to expect that, <laughs> you know, as Satan has used um, sexual immorality to attack us, it's just going to continue to get worse. It's not going to get any better. Um, so it's just... that's one of our weak, weak, well, that's our weak spot. That it is such a to... powerful thing that Satan knows that that's something he can use and he's going to use it against us, for sure. And all the things that you see <coughs> happening... It's the way it's set up. It's, it's just the way it's set up. He gets, he gets stronger in the worldly uh, until it leads up to it and then God just... Nope, that's it. Well, Jesus is important. here, you're done, you're gone. All you guys are out here, this is us. But I think, again, like you were talking about, it's important to go to here, because it's not just enough to say, well, God, you know, God says you shouldn't have sex before you're married. Like, it, it does help to.